about this change that happened so rapidly? I mean, the team, the leadership team at North Coast, and as you've been thinking these things through, I mean, there's a lot of change that's had to take. By the way, these three men here are not small fries in the EFCA. On the left, Kevin Complin there is the president of the EFCA. And Larry Osborne is is kind of the EFCA guru on um, church planting and, and church health. And Eddie Cole, I'm not sure who he is. His title there is ex- Executive VP for National Ministries, but I've never had any interaction with him, so I'm not exactly sure who he is. But I know who he is. But Kevin and Larry are uh, two of the highest up people in the EFCA. Place quickly, uh, you know what? What have you share with us a little bit about what have you done and, and what's that looking like and, and and how's it going for you? The number one thing we've been noticing is it's uh, so different than we thought. Uh, I I have, when I talk to leaders, I'm always saying plan in pencil. And this has been really one of those times. We do not need to think like an architect with a blueprint. We need to think like a coach with a game plan because the scoreboard. As a pastor, I think maybe a better way to think is as a pastor with a Bible than a coach with a game plan. You know, so just thought I'd throw that in there. Maybe that's a better analogy for pastors to, to think about changing over and over and over. And I sometimes feel like every couple of weeks, we've got completely different answers because we've got completely different facts. Hey, Larry, I I know you do a lot of coaching with pastors from across the country, and you've got to be seeing this as the restrictions are being lifted. A lot of us are just eager to get back to church. We're eager to get out and do about anything, but especially get back to church. And but, you know, I know in the middle of all this, we all want to do it wisely and we need to do it with, you know, a lot of intentionality. And I know that you're one of the early voices that I've heard basically saying, hey, we really need to approach this with caution and care. And you you said in a conversation the other day, just pause it right there. Maybe Larry is one of the early voices to say that, but it does seem like that's pretty much the dominant voice coming from everywhere. So I don't, I don't know, but that seems to be more of a consensus than somebody who is riding against the tide here. Uh, that you, that there were three things that you have been thinking about that you're not hearing other people talk about a whole lot. So would you mind to talk to us and tell us what those three things are? The three things that we began to think through, I'll give them on the front and then back, uh, go back at them as quality, our quality, children, and worship. Somebody just walk through those. Quality. When we talk about a socially uh, safe, distanced service, we're talking about a sucky service. (laughs) We all know that if you've ever been to a comedy in a theater and it's half full, it's not funny. All right. So is that really how pastors think about worship? Are we comedians? If you go to a comedy club and it's half full... The comedian isn't funny. What does that have to do with worship? Who, what biblical pastor who is taking seriously 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and by his authority preach the word. What in the world does a comedy club have to do with anything related to the church. And then, you know, a sucky experience. What does that mean? What, is that what worship is? You know, that's, and I think that's what, you know, one of the things that's come out through this whole situation is that we have seen, maybe, you know, we suspected this for a while, but this has been confirmed that what worship is for a lot of Christians, nominal Christians in our in our nation is an experience on Sunday that they go to like they go to the movies. And well, we can't have it be sucky to use his word, you know, not not my favorite word, but what about the early church holed up in a house while Peter was in prison waiting his execution having a, a prayer meeting? Was that a sucky experience? I don't think they had the fog machine going and the light, the jam-packed building and all that kind of stuff going on. I mean, you know, what about when Paul was in Philippi and he went down to the riverside because there wasn't a synagogue and there was a handful of people there, mostly women, 
That must have been a really sucky worship service, mustn't it have? It's amazing that anyone got saved at that service. This is, this is really revealing something going on in evangelicalism that is seriously problematic because this is not somebody who's an outlier. This is somebody who has massive influence in a, in a denomination that has the name evangelical in it and that isn't alone in this kind of thinking. We know how horrible it is to speak to that service where everybody scatters. That's why we try to shrink them down. I want to tell you, not only speaking to it or trying to lead worship in it, just being in it is like not a very good experience. And we just flat out can't do a quality experience with that kind of uh, separation. Now, you know, again, it's, it's all about the experience. It's not a quality experience. Well, no wonder our neighbors think we go to church for selfish reasons, right? No wonder our, our testimony for the gospel is hindered if we keep meeting during coronavirus, because the message we've been telling our neighbors is this is a great experience for me, and I don't want to give up that experience. You know, it's this kind of thing that underlies our, our culture's view of what church is and what Christianity is. You know, I've preached to as few as, as three people in a church one time, and honestly, it wasn't any more sucky than the times I've preached to hundreds of people in a church. So, because, you know, the reality is when I get in the pulpit, there's really only one person that I'm preaching for. And his name is Jesus. And so, you know, whether there's three people or 3,000 people is, is irrelevant. You know, the, the, the audience that you're hoping to please, because the only one, the only sermon feedback that's going to matter is the Second Timothy 4, 1 and 2 sermon feedback from Christ when you stand before him to give an account for what you did. And I don't think we see anywhere in Scripture where Jesus is going to say to any of his servants, you just gave him such a sucky experience. You know, that, that's just such an unbiblical way of thinking about church and worship. It's very sad. What that also means, besides quality, is uh, we got a children's problem. And we're talking about all kinds of things as I hear, hear the, the stuff out there. What are we going to do, kids, to make socially distance and all that? Uh, well, well, here's the thing. Kids don't do social distancing, right? And up of that, if you make them do it, all but the most introverted kid is going to call that the worst class they ever had in their life. And they're going to come out saying, Mom, Dad, never send me there again. Yeah. Uh, so this defines children's ministry today, doesn't it? Children's ministry is essentially the Disney channel for kids at, at church. Loving the Word of God, loving the teaching of the Word of God is something that parents have to teach their children to do. I don't expect my kids to leave a worship service and think that it was like going to Disneyland or going to the movies and seeing their, a movie they like. I am cultivating in them, hopefully, by the grace of God, a heart that loves the Word of God and, and trying to teach them that it's not your experience that's important. It's hearing and obeying the Word of God that matters. And, and so here we see a massive problem with children's ministry uh, being exposed here as well. So it's just no win-win. Uh, now, I have three grown kids with all young kids, preschool age. Uh, so in each of their families, uh, once we get these smaller gatherings allowed, they're going to they're gonna look very much forward to a play group at the park or whatever, but it's going to be made up of their friends they feel that comfort and trust with, which is very different than dropping your kids off when there's people you don't know where they've been or what they've done. Now, on top of that, what I found is they'll go, well, what we'll do is we'll bring them into the service. Oh, great. You already got a sucky service, and now you're bringing a bunch of kids who are going to be running around? That's going to really help. And then they'll... Now, I don't know what's worse, the comment or the, the laughter from the guy who's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the EFCA, Kevin Compline, thinking that that's funny. Look at the Old Testament gatherings to hear the reading of the Word of God. You know who was there? Everyone. Uh, adults, old people, teenagers, young adults, children, nursing infants. They didn't even have a nursery, and they stood for the reading of the Word of God. I mean, imagine that, bringing your kids to church making them be in the service the whole time and standing for the sermon, which, you know, at Desert Hills, the sermon is usually at least 45 minutes long. So I can tell you from experience that standing that long is tiring, right? I'm the only one who has to do it. Uh, it it's, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to just stand there for 45 minutes, especially if you're not the one preaching. 
And in the Old Testament, they stood for hours and listened to the Word of God being read and taught and explained. You know, this is just revealing. You know, we talk about this problem with, with young adults and that they want to, you know, when they get to college, they leave the church. When you have this kind of mindset, they've never left the church because they've never been in the church. Uh, they're not allowed in the church because they would just turn the experience into one sucky experience, according to Larry Osborne here. And we can't have kids running around uh, the church. The church is, the worship service is designed by God for the family. If you read through the epistles of Paul in Ephesians and Colossians, children are addressed directly in the letter. Paul expected children to be present in the worship service. He didn't expect children to be off, you know, watching Christian Disney somewhere in in some other building of the church. He expected that they would be there. And by the way, Paul puts children in chapter 6 of Ephesians, which means he thought they were still paying attention even at the end of the sermon. That's the last chapter. It wasn't like, well, we got to hit the kids first because they're going to check out if we don't put it right up front. It's it's there at the end. They're they're addressed at the end. And this is really just egregious. You know, when, you know, when we think about gathering as the people of God, that we would see children as an inconvenience, children as getting in the way of our experience. Again, no wonder the world thinks that we're selfish in our gathering. Last piece, and, 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 and for me, this was the tipping point, and I think for our team, the tipping point is this worship piece. We've known all along that there are three primary contagion environments. You know, a lot of times 90 to 98 percent of the people who have died of this are from these environments. And they are uh, senior care facilities, cruise ships, and choirs. Now, I had known the choir piece, but I put two and two together and got eight. Because I'd heard about the one in Georgia, the one in Washington, the different groups, secular and Christian groups. They, they got together to sing, and there's 65 people in it, and 35 got it, and four died. And I thought, wow, I never put together why. Put your head in front of your face and sing. You're spewing stuff everywhere. So we either got to increase the social distancing, wear a mask, plus on top of that, no one wants to sing when they can hear themselves unless they're a musician. So I remember when I was at North Coast Church where Larry's pastoring for EFCA1 maybe five years ago in 2015, and uh, my biggest complaint about the music was I couldn't hear myself sing. Uh, I'm not going to sing for you because that would eliminate the entire audience immediately. I am not a good singer. And you know what? When I'm singing to the Lord, that, that's irrelevant. I, I mean, I would like to f- hear myself to see if I'm at least reasonably on key or to know that, that I am actually worshiping. You know, it's not, it's not supposed to be some kind of concert venue where I can't hear myself sing and praise the Lord, or I can't hear the person next to me. I mean, I, I love, I love being in church, hearing my kids sing. And I love that it's, it's, you know, that our, our worship leaders have the sensitivity to turn the volume up to a level that we can hear them and not necessarily drown them out. But at the same time, I can still hear the people in my row singing, you know, hearing my children sing, hearing the people behind me sing. And, you know, sometimes the people behind me can really sing and sometimes they sing like I do, but I don't care because it's, it's the worship of God. It's hearing. I love to look around the church, you know, people maybe get weirded out by that with the pastor looking all over the place while they're singing and wondering what I'm looking at. But I just like to experience the singing with the congregation, you know, so this, this idea here that, um, you know, we have to wait to regather until we can have the smoke and mirrors and a laser show, and it can be this incredible experience, betrays the idea that really uh, we have lost what worship is. Worship is not about me having a good experience. It's about me responding to what God has done for me in Christ by His grace and obedience and in joy and love and coming before him because he's commanded me to do that. And unless I am providentially hindered, obeying that command, whether that means it's me and two other people in, in, a, in, a, in a duly ordained church with qualified church leadership, preaching the word, administering the sacraments, or whether that's a group of, of 5,000 people 
It's that's irrelevant. It's a response to a divine command. Well, this video goes on for another few minutes and it doesn't get any better. So we'll just stop there. I won't torture you with, uh, with the last four minutes of that video, but, but I thought I'd show that because it, it, it's so indicative of the environment that we're living in. And, um, you know, one thing it does is it really helps you to know how to pray for some of your Christian friends too, who maybe go to churches like North coast or other churches, um, in those areas where it's all about the experience and they don't maybe even recognize that they don't see the problem with it. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he'll go on in the video to say later is that it isn't, um, you know, where the discipleship happens is in the small groups, not in the big gathering on Sunday morning. So they really got to get those going. And, uh, you, you know, one of the things that is that we see is true in church after church is that the church only takes the Bible as seriously as it is taken in the pulpit. And, you know, I've heard this from people that, well, it's our small group that really takes scripture seriously. And what I found is that those well-meaning people who, who I think genuinely love the Lord don't really know what it means to take the Bible seriously because it's never been modeled for them from the pulpit. And uh, this is just one example. And what's, you know, I think what concerns me, what, what, what troubles me about that is it's not uh, just some, you know, small video from, you know, one misguided person, but this is a video that is out there to influence thousands of churches throughout an entire movement and it's very dangerous.